Well, <coughs> so much for gas welding. We could stay with that. There's still an awful lot of gas welding done. It's a very convenient form of welding to do because we don't have to generate an electric, uh, high amperage electric uh, source. So we can move to then to some of the other methods of welding. And one of the uh, methods of welding is with an oxyacetylene torch, <coughs> excuse me, is with a, uh, a rod, a welding rod. And we're going to use a, an arc welding. And in this particular case, all we have to do is have a stick and we touch it to the surface and it will weld. But something that's very popular today is to use something that's called plasma arc welding. And in plasma arc welding, you have a, a system that looks something like this. It, you, this is the torch head now in the plasma arc weld. And what we're really going to do is we're going to have uh, a little device in this that's going to carry the current. We're going to carry a current through this thing. And in that rod, uh, that current is going to melt the material that's ahead of it. But we want to make sure we don't get any oxygen in the system and we want to get as hot a flame as we possibly can. And so actually, we can we bring in a gas that we're going to ionize and that particular gas is uh, brought in, into one chamber down at the very tip of the uh, torch and at the tip of the torch now it can be ionized. It's going to be ionized and when it changes back to the gas it's supposed to be it generates one terrific energy and so we can have a welding torch that has a, a real high energy source. It's high energy source, higher energy source in some case than electric arc well. In the next slide, <coughs> we see that there are two kinds of, of uh, connections that we can have there. And in one case, the arc is set up uh, directly with the base material that we're trying to weld. In the second case, we have the arc that's really performed inside of the gun, but it, it creates an a area in here, in a plasma in here, that's exceedingly hot and can still weld the base material. But we can use such a torch and put materials together uh, with no great effort. <coughs> Then we use uh, setup for doing uh, submerged uh, or shielded metal arc welding, and this is the way most welding is done. Uh, that's arc welding, and all we have to do have is a holder, a stick of material. This is the filler material, and that particular filler material now is uh, fed into the cavity between the two pieces we want to join. But at the same time, we have a cover on the outside which melts, and that particular melt that we have covers the material, protects it, and so we have, in effect, uh, a shielded uh, arc that goes on there. The shielding comes from the gas that's developed and the slag that's developed from the coating that's on this electrode, that's on this piece here. Typically, if you had an enormous piece to weld, let, let's suppose you're in a power plant and you wanted to melt, uh, weld together a high uh, pressure tube. Let's say the, the, the tubing that's going to carry the high pressure steam to the first stage of the turbine. You may have something that's going to be like an eighth, excuse me, like three eighths to two inches thick as a pipe wall. A seamless tube because the pressure is going to be so high inside. You have to weld that together. So you would chamfer the two edges, bring them together so that there's a big V-notch. You're going to start filling it at the bottom and then bring it all the way up to the top. And the process there would be as in that slide. And what we would do is, since we have a big gap to fill, we would go along and fill the root of that notch. Then we'd come back over and fill one edge and go back and fill another edge. And we'd just keep working it around and around. And we'd build it up until we got a thicker and thicker and thicker section until we filled it all up and have it all, both, all welded together. And you say, hey, great, look at that. I didn't get any oxidation in that thing. I used a stick that's exactly the same composition as the uh, parent material, uh, and it's all together. I take it in the shop and I test it, and it says it's a perfectly good weld. And I go home and I feel very happy about it. But let's look at the 1947 story. 1947, in the power industry in Pennsylvania, shutting down a power plant, a group of workers went in and shut a great big valve that took the high pressure line off of the system. And as they spun this valve shut, it's, it's sort of a shock when you take all of this pressure off of the pipe. The piping on the other side of the valve, the part that they had relieved now, just broke out of the system and fell on the floor. 
and it broke right on the well. Well, you can imagine that everybody was horrified. Actually, if that pipe had fallen in on the other side, then it had all of this high pressure steam in the power plant, and it had all sorts of problems. So what was wrong? They took the piece of pipe and they sectioned it, and they looked at where it broke, and they found that there was graphite in there. Graphite in a carbon molly pipe, 0.35% carbon. Where did the graphite come from? Well, it turns out that the story started way back in the early teens and 20s. You don't remember that. I don't even remember that, although I was living. But what happened was they were making automobiles in this country, and they began to make a lot of them. And the Model T Ford, if you remember, just had an old slab of a fender and a running board, right? And finally they said, hey, let's, let's make it fancier, and they came along with the Model A and then the, and the V8 and all these things, and they had deep wells, deep uh, fenders, deep uh, contours that were made by all of the processes that we've talked before. But it meant that they're plastically deformed this material and generally cold. <clears throat> and they found out if they had great big crystals in it, since they deformed in different directions at different rates, they wound up with a, say, a fender pulled out that looked like an orange peel. It was bumpy. It didn't paint up nice. Well, in a Model T Ford, who cared, right? But now if you're going to get a nice lacquered car, then we do care. And so the automotive industry said to the steel industry, hey, can't you give us a, they knew what was wrong, they said, can't you give us a steel that has little teeny fine grains, inherently fine grains? And the steel industry says, yes, we can. And what we will do is we won't kill the steel with silicon or manganese. We'll kill the steel with aluminum because the aluminum oxide particles will be dispersed in such a fine state throughout the steel that they will serve as little nucleation sites in the austenitic range and we'll always, always have fine grains, right? And then you'll have a smooth piece. And so the practice of aluminum killing steel began. But guess what? Aluminum is a graphitizer, just like silicon, just like a high scientist. And so aluminum killed steel with as much aluminum as they were putting in it, actually would cause the iron carbide to want to break down. But it wouldn't break down. It used it many times before. The whole, in the whole pipe, the, the iron carbide didn't break down. Wh why did it break down just at the weld? And the reason was, you see, if you, if you melt the material at one spot and the rest of it is at room temperature, somewhere in the profile, the temperature profile, there's going to be a zone. On one side of that zone, the material will be austenitic. On the other side of the zone, it's going to be ferritic. There's going to be a, an enormous residual stress in this piece because the material is trying to expand and contract. We went through that little exercise, right? With trying to quench a big ball. So just as the shape of the welding arc went through in like little, little arcuate sections that are uh, imposed on one another, so the graphite came out in little arcuate sections. And they called it eyebrow graphite. So here in this low carb piece of low carbon steel that we would never expect to find any graphite in, because of the tessellated stresses, the residual stresses due to the welding, we had this eyebrow graphite. So you can bet that every power company in the world began to go back and try to examine what kind of conditions are our wells in. And they would plan to shoot these little boats and we would examine them all of everywhere in 1947, 48. It was a big, big enterprise going on. And we went back and annealed these materials. That is, we wrapped coils around them and by induction heating, heat the, heat the whole pipe up, the weld and everything, to relieve these residual stresses. So when we go through and just do the operations like we saw in this slide, we can get into an awful lot of trouble. Well, <coughs> let's go on and look at some of the other systems that we can use. Uh, in this, this is just the fundamentals now of what, what's really going on. Uh, we look at, at the slag blanket that's developed. This is just the mechanism of what we've seen before. We're, we're using the flux, we're melting it, we're getting a well pool that's down the bottom here actually down in here, but we have this uh, gaseous shield that's over top of it and a flux that is over top of that that's superimposed over everything. So we're sort of protecting the whole thing as we go along and well. We can do something else, <coughs> and that is we can electric weld the material and we can use all sorts of welding currents on the material. Actually, uh, this slide is just desi designed to show you that if you're going to use a certain wire size, you're going to have to a certain current range in this. 
Uh, I think this is almost obvious because if you tried to push, oh, let's say, 600 amps through a, a wire that was a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, then what you're going to have is you have a hot wire in your hands, right? So you, you have to have this thing matched so that you're going to have the high temperature only where that little weldment is, is supposed to occur. So we have to pay a lot of attention not only to the composition of the weld stick, but the diameter of the weld stick to match it with the size of the job we're going to do. <coughs> then we have something called electric slag, electro slag welding. And in this particular case, what we're going to do is, this is a submerged welding uh, technique also, but we actually can get a current to pass through the slag that's here. And so we can weld under, we can cause melting to occur under the slag. The thing that's always amazing to me is that they do this particular operation and they weld something together and they get any configuration that they want. I, I, I thought that what was put in the, in the little text that you have was pretty nice because it showed you some of these uh, combinations that you can see. And you see that you can get uh, butt wells that uh, look like this or you can get section changes that look like this or in the next slide you will see that you can get uh, uh, right angle turns that will look like this or, or T wells that look like that or uh, angle wells that look like this. There's a whole array of combinations of these things that you can get by this electroslag welding and it's a, it's a neat system. And we have another system of welding that's called resistance welding. And here we have a setup for a resistance spot welding. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, in this particular case, we have two pieces that we want to weld together. Uh, the top piece and the bottom piece, let's suppose they're the same thing, but we, we, we just loosely put them together. They're clamped so that very tightly clamped together between these two electrodes, this electrode and electro that electrode. These electrodes will always be uh, high conductivity material and generally a high strength material like a phosphor bronze or a, a copper that has a little bit of alloying element in it to increase its strength. And where it's rammed together at this particular point is going to be the conductive path, but it's going to be a high resistance path and it'll cause the material to melt on both sides. And we have this little nugget, this little molten zone, and it melts in that molten zone. And when we take the uh, current off, it solidifies immediately and we have a little spot that's welded. And if you look, if you examined your automobiles or if you looked at the way to put automobiles together, this is a, a good way, a way that's generally used to, to tack together the fenders and the bodywork. So any sheet metal, lots of sheet metal work is done this way. But there's a very intriguing problem that has to do with this. That is to say, if you did that particular kind of weld and you pulled a tensile test on this particular piece, try to pull it apart and shear, you'd find it would be some certain value, some load that it would take to pull it apart. If you then made 10 times as many of those little spot wells and say, well, now I will expect that the force required to pull it apart is going to be 10 times as great, then you find out that you're not going to be right. And the reason is that every time you do this, you're going to have some slight distortion in the piece, around the piece, and that particular distortion means that if you now pull on ends, we do not have a uniform load application applied on the whole thing, and it's almost like the dislocation picture. We can load them one at a time, and so they go pop, 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 and come apart. So you have to be very careful in this kind of a welding operation to try to get the distribution of the spot welds so continuous that when they're, properly, when they're loaded, they're, the load will be properly distributed and hang together. Not only can you do this in resistance welding with spots, you can also do this in, uh, in conditions where you have a, a circular uh, element, a circular electrode at the top and the bottom, <clears throat> and we can just run a piece through here, uh, and when we do that, then we do the same thing, except now we're going to weld a little seam along with the material. Actually, I think the next slide uh, shows you one that's even more complicated, but it's the same thing. It's, it's just running into the machine now, but we do it on the edge, and we can run seams and attach uh, parts together. Well, let, let me tell you, with this last technique now, something that I've seen, that is, to me, just absolutely fascinating. Uh, I was telling one of the gentlemen before class about this, but I, I visited NASA Langley once. And NASA Langley, was, we were talking about super plasticity, because we can turn Ti-6-4, titanium 6 vanadium 4 aluminum, into a super plastic material at about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it, it is a material which at room temperature may have a ductility of like 20 percent 
and at this particular temperature has a ductility at a slow testing rate of something like 100%. Like chewing